I had placed motor neurodural neuron disease on the same shelf in my brain where I keep this phone number for my digni- dignitas in S- S- Switzerland. This was a, on a high up shelf in the outhouse with a broken tricycle and an unused bread maker. Immediately prior to receiving my diagnosis, I had, had been scratching in the corridor. I was holding my phone and burrowing insanely through online drivel with my phone bump. This was a few moments before. When I started crying, my head was parallel with my desktop. The subway experience was just like the deep vibrations a kitchen tap of the main water is turned back on a series of metallic shudders through my spine of chug a gurgle and then water I remember looking up at Jill she was crying more gently as she looked down at me I was over her knee by this point and with my neck arched up towards her and on her face was the shock of sorrow. Not for myself, for me. I never read a face like that in a moment like that again. It's a wonder to know that with all the muscular vibration the human face is capable of some permutations are as unique as fingerprints. I spent five years days crying there were intermission when it would intermissions when I would build school on a wooden tower blocks with Tom these periods and they would fresh fluids be taken in so I could begin again at high, night time or during the school days during those nights I awoke several times to cry often I just been dreaming of the diagnosis and then sitting up in the bed. The expectation was that they would flow to, in to dissipate, would dissolve. When it didn't, it was as if dreams had lost their function. It was an unschooling of the ways in which bad dreams are meant to be disposed, dispersed. Sleep was not diminished, and waking was never quite achieved. When crying came at night, I was squeezing the duvet in my fists and thinking very acutely of the physicality of Tom and Jimmy. It must have been something close to focus medication, meditation, because I could imagine a current form, then focus on the changes that I imagined they would take place in their bodies in the years to come. I imagined the lengthening of Tom's lean legs and the broadening of the V-neck, V-shaped jawline. I imagined the fine hair, face hair that would appear on his face. I imagined his length and strength, and those cheekbones that would one day underlie his gaze. With Jimmy, I love and marvel at the width of his face and his hands. I imagine him continuing to be broad and solid. His shoulders would be thickened, and his jawline would be rounder than Tom's. I imagine him shorter than Tom, but more burly. It's, in Jimmy's case, I always felt guilt. I knew his physical frame and form, but he would never remember mine. He would often nap on the hand bed with his chin cupped in, in his hands and they would talk to his sleeping body and tell him not how sorry I was. During these days, as I felt like some figure was cutting around me with a pair of scissors, moving me with the blades to cut close and accurately. I saw the paper turn more of me around, would drop down. I knew that it wouldn't take long for the scissors to have made their way around. I'd be imagining the boys and Jill living in a place I might not know, a life they worked, but which was alien to me. Boys older, life happening. I'll be looking all at all this from the outside. I cling, cling to Jill, but I saw her and Tom and Jimmy connected by something I was 
I wasn't. Until this time, I've just assumed that they were formed from a single face, that something like this could never happen. At the end of these, those five days of crying, I walked the water seat back into the ground. The emotions left behind were those that I never allowed myself to feel fully know of, or really feel vulnerability of what I was and am or will become. Very simple in the feelings. I had conversations about the value of laughter, but I have no longer believe it is the best medication. At the end of my five days of crying, I felt calmer, more at ease than at any time in my life. I would have held out my hand and weighed myself in my palm and guessed exactly to a gram the scale of this little bit of mine. I knew myself in these dark days. I felt quiet, I listened to your loss and knew exactly where and who I was. It felt like a gift. Yeah, I'll be there in a minute. Extremely small, yet capricious, against a dark background. There's something we claimed. The months go by, some of the, seri- the serious decline happens. Almost especially as I'd fallen asleep and been awoken by the familiar platform announcement. The medical professionals start initiating a conversation about value and dignity in dying. It, hap- it feels as if I am in the midst of preparation for something. Various documents have been handed to me and various choices presented. A bit like the baggage of the car or I aim as a seed the days before flying. I find death an interesting, too interesting that I wish I could have known about it earlier. I've been to funerals before, but I didn't think I'd ever pick that up that this would also happen to me one day. But now I realise how essential this information is and it is our journey. So no matter how enjoy or lost its value without a clear sense that it will at some point come to an end. When Jill and I first wrote our wills, we requested our ashes be scattered in the Indian Himalayas, which is not a decision that anyone with a banner's idea their own morality would make if it sounds like an option you might select for a wager or something that was an outside chance of occurring. Clean clear that it really was something that was happening. It was Jill who initiated the likely idea of a woodland grave close to where we lived in Hampshire. Bluebells grew on the site. I'm planning to have a bench above my grave. I met I might put a ramp at the end of the bench from which toy cars can launch in the undergrowth. Jill likes the idea of coming here with the boys and there are paths leading everywhere. I'm disappearing now and this above ground work feels like part of the preparation for the gradual changes that have come. The slowing is probably common to anyone who has had the time to really experience dying. It feels like a slight drop in the temperature, in the noise too. It's slowing down, which is then, which is when, then gives the appearance it lovers you are moving around much more quickly. Jill, my children, and post the, the postman, Frida, my friend's dog. I know I have no connection to their speed. It's a gradual incline. To a gradual introduction to the art of being still, not a violent one as it is for many others. I mean, it's something not widely appreciated about my disease, a sense which enables people to gently build up the moment of kind practice so that the translation can be made as smooth as possible. The following was an extract from the short history of falling. Everything Observed About Love Whilst Dying by Joe Hammond it was published by Fourth Estate by £12.99 Out Nile, 5 stars, recommended.